Hi folks, this is Robert Wallace, uh, Mr. Wallace, your driver education teacher. And uh, we are now looking at lesson five, uh, driving maneuvers. So we had finished up last lesson with our de real defensive driving and we're going into driving maneuvers. Just a quick recap though for our defensive driving. So we were talking about space and distance. Some of the things we want to recap are these. First of all, we employ basically two, uh, two skills or two ways or techniques of using defensive driving or, or doing defensive driving. The first one is SIPTI, which stands for Search, Identify, Predict, Decide, and Execute. And a quick recap of that is that we are, uh, when we're driving, we're scanning, uh, we're looking, you know, we are doing our driving bit, and we're also scanning too for possible hazards, okay? And uh, sometimes we identify, well, we always want to identify the, the potential hazards, um, and we want to predict what they might do. You know, what, what is the next step that they're going to take that would endanger us and pose a true hazard to, to our driving? If that does happen, then we shift into decide mode. What are we going to do? A lot of times, and this is my rule of thumb for our beginning drivers, is when we're in that identify and predict mode, we are taking, and this is what, a seasoned driver will do, we usually release the accelerator with our foot. We take our foot off the accelerator. It may be hovering over the accelerator or it may be hovering over the brakes and we're buying some time and space for us to decide what's, what's going to happen. So while we're predicting, we're actually buying a bit of time and space. The next step is this, if it becomes a true hazard, we need to decide what to do. And your foot's ready for that. Your foot's ready to either accelerate, uh, it, which sometimes happens, remember the Buffalo story, or to use our brakes, okay? Which is more common than accelerating by far, all right? Sometimes we don't need to do either one and we're just going to perform a driving maneuver, which is part of today's lesson. Executing is actually performing the task that we decide to do. The second uh, set of skills that we employ when we're when we're doing defensive driving is what we what is the Smith system, and you're going to recognize it when I start using the word space cushion. Okay, so <laughs> in the Smith system, yes, we are looking up, we're getting the big picture of things, but we're monitoring around our car what our what is our space cushion? We're monitoring ahead of us. How many seconds do we have? We and, and we, you know, in distance we actually talk in terms of seconds. How many seconds ahead of me do I have before I can bring my car to a full stop? How many seconds do I have behind me with a vehicle behind me, where I can bring my car to a full stop and I have some seconds, uh, you know, where I can expect the driver behind me to to bring his car to a full stop, okay? We also have on either side a space cushion that I call outs. We haven't, we sometimes have these, sometimes we have an out on the right side. It could be an extra lane. It could be a shoulder of a road. It could in fact be a field, okay? What it cannot be is something that's going to do more, you know, extreme damage to us trees, a river, um, a cement guardrail. These are not outs for us. Another car in the lane, that is not an out. We also have the same option on the left from time to time, okay? And the Smith system is being about being aware of our outs, okay? And being aware of our space cushion. And how do we do that? Well. We are constantly monitoring how much space we have in front of us in terms of seconds, 
and we can comment on this while we're doing our drives, and we should be, how many seconds we have behind us compared to the vehicle that's falling behind us. And again, we're talking in terms of seconds, and we should be commentating in terms of what the out on the right-hand side of our vehicle looks like. Is it a really good one, or is it one that we really don't want to use unless it's an emergency? If it's full of snow and slush, it's not very welcoming. It's only going to be one, uh, or, or a field, for example. That's, that's all we want. That's only for an emergency then, right? Okay, or maybe we have a free lane on the left-hand side or the right-hand side. So we employ these two systems every time we're driving defensively. We should be commenting to our passenger uh, you know, monitor how we're monitoring this, how we're looking in the mirrors, how we're getting the big picture, how many seconds ahead, how many seconds behind, how is the road, what is the road features that limit that? Do we have blind turns coming up? Do we have a hill that that minimizes our um, amount of, of space that we can see ahead of us? Okay. Uh, we should also be commenting on uh, potential hazards. So a, a cyclist in the road, for example, uh, a garbage truck that is in our lane, for example, or a truck that's unloading uh, products for a store. These are all potential hazards for sure. Okay. And, you know, it could be uh, some kids playing in the yard. They're, they're a potential hazard and we have to keep our eye on them a bit while we're driving. And we're, we, we talked again, too, about uh, the type of vision that we employ while we're driving. We have our central vision, which is key to being able to read signs and give truly focused, uh, read really focused information. We have our fringe vision, which is going to allow us to recognize potential hazards like children playing ball, in the, not in the road, but in their yard. Um, or a car that's reversing from the driveway into our lane. Okay, and then we have our peripheral vision, which picks up movement and picks up changes in color. It's wonderful for the to give us a, that first alert that something wrong is happening, uh, or something something's changing, like. For example, a car is coming out of our blind spot, for example, okay? So with all that in mind, let's move on to driving maneuvers. So some of these driving maneuvers are going to be regular driving maneuvers. Um, our emergency driving maneuvers don't come up until much later in our course. Uh, however, we are going to, uh, we are going to hit the, the emergency maneuvers, um, I believe it's in Lesson number 14 later on in the course. So with all that being said, let's get going with driving maneuvers for today. And if I can go trying to, uh -oh, let me go to the present mode. And here we go. I believe, no, I can't. Okay, no, I can't. All right, here we go. So review of steering techniques. Three, there are three steering techniques that we need to know when it comes to changing the direction of our car, okay? There's hand over hand steering, there's hand to hand steering, and then there's one hand steering. When we are steering, we recommend that you have your thumbs up on the steering wheel. Fix allows you to have a less tight grip, <coughs> Um, and it keeps you from oversteering when, uh, you know, for especially for beginner drivers. Hand over hand steering. So here's how you do it. I'd like you to pretend you have the wheel in your hands right now. Okay. So go ahead and put your hands up as if you had the wheel. Okay. So you should be grasping the steering wheel with your right hand at three o'clock and your left hand at nine o'clock. Okay. Uh, and we recommend three o'clock and nine o'clock instead of 10 and two, mainly because at 10 and two, there's a more likely chance that your arms are going to get broken if your airbag inflates. Okay. So we, um, that's, that's where we are. 
with that. So we want three and nine. Okay, hands up, three and nine. Use the opposite hand of the turning direction to start the turn. So let's pretend we're going to turn left here, just like the picture, right? So we're going to use the opposite hand. If we're turning left, we want to start with our right hand, okay? One hand pushes the steering wheel up. That's going to be our right hand. It's pushing up, okay? Past the 12 o'clock position, while the other hand reaches up to the 12 o'clock position. That's your left hand. And pulls down towards the 9 o'clock position. We're turning left, okay? Rotating the wheel in this fashion for the degree of turn needed. All right? The more turn you need, the slower your car should be, and the more you're going to need to turn your steering wheel. Okay, now let's let's reverse. Now, and if you release it and your car is moving, the steering wheel is automatically going to correct itself. Isn't that a nice thing? It's, I know when I was a child, I was always amazed by that. Let's <laughs> practice doing it the, the other way now. Okay, hands are at three and nine. I know this might sound a little silly, but it's it's pretty useful. Okay, and it really gives you uh, the feeling of hand over hand steering. Hands are at three and three to nine. We want to take a right hand turn, so we're looking for any pedestrians crossing the road. Okay, we want to look where we're turning. Okay, with our right hand, we're pulling the wheel down. With our left hand, we're reaching up to. I'm sorry. With our with our right hand, we're reaching up. With our left hand, we're pushing over to the right-hand side. Our right hand reaches up and grips the wheel at the 12 o'clock position and then pulls down while, while our left hand releases. Keep turning as much as you need to make the turn. Okay, remember, slow car, fast hands gets the job done. Okay, when we are done and we've got... We've made our complete turn. We can release the wheel and it will correct itself. And then hands go back to nine and three. How wonderful is that? Okay, so that is hand over hand steering and you will need it if you are making tight turns. We're gonna talk about speed in a minute, but a general rule of thumb is that the tighter your turn, the slower your car needs to be. And we're talking like in 10 miles per hour, maybe 15 miles per hour. That's the range we're talking about when we're doing hand over hand steering. 10 miles per hour, five miles per hour. We are going fast. Let's continue. <clears throat> hand to hand steering is a little different, okay? This, again, you're going to consider putting your hands at the 9 and 3 position, okay? I'm going to read it to you. Get your hands ready. Starting at the 9 to 3 position on the wheel, let's pretend we're making a left-hand turn again, just like in the picture. One hand pushes up. Your right hand's going to push up on the steering wheel to the 12 o'clock position, while your left hand slides to the top of the steering wheel and then grips it, and then your right hand releases while your left hand pulls the steering wheel down. You repeat this action until your turn is complete. As you accelerate out of the turn, you can again release the wheel, let it slide through your hands, and resume the nine and three position, okay? This is sometimes called feeding the wheel or push-pull steering. We call it hand-to-hand -hand steering. I want to practice going the right way too, okay? T taking a right-hand turn, making a right-hand turn. So hold your wheel again, and we're going to steer to the right. So again, looking for pedestrians, Look in. now we're looking at where we want to go, okay? So we're looking over to our right, look around that, pillar, make sure there's no <coughs> pedestrian behind the pillar of your windshield. Then we are going to turn the wheel, release with your right hand, bring your left hand up to 12 o'clock, bring your right hand up to 12, one o'clock, okay? 
release with the left hand, pull down with the right hand, grip with the left hand, slide up with the right hand, grip with the right hand, release with the left hand, bring down with the right hand until your turn is complete. And then release the steering wheel as you accelerate, bringing your hands back to the nine and three position. It feels great to feel the steering wheel like slide through your hand like that, correcting itself. Okay, one hand steering. When do we do it? When do we not do it? Okay. Now, this is the perfect technique that we see right here in the picture for one-handed steering. The hand is at the top of the steering wheel. Now, I want you to think about this for a minute. If your hand is at the top of the steering wheel, it really can't make really large, wide degrees of, of steering, can it? Okay, I mean, it really becomes quite difficult, especially if your thumb is not gripping the entire part of the wheel. It becomes really challenging. We will not recommend any, and we won't accept any one-handed steering when you are driving straight ahead, except when you need to use one of your hands to activate or deactivate one of the apparatuses in your car, okay? It could be your windshield wipers, windshield fluid. It could be your indicators, although you should be able to do that with both hands on the wheel. It could be your air conditioning or your or your defogging part of your air conditioning. Okay, so there are times when you do need to drive with one hand, but only for like a split second or less. Now, the only other time that we recommend one-handed steering is when you're doing what this driver's doing here. You probably recognize what he's doing by the direction he's looking in and where his other hand is. His other hand is on the back of the passenger uh, chair or seat, right? So, hands at the top of the wheel. And let's see if I can make my color. I don't know if I can. I want to make it a little thicker. And I don't know. I don't, I don't think I can, guys. I apologize for that. I thought it would go a little thicker. Anyway, his... Uh, interesting. Okay. So, his hands right here on top of the steering wheel... His head is looking back. His hand is on the back of the chair, okay? This is the perfect alignment for driving backwards, okay? Or backing up. Now, his foot, by the way, is not on the accelerator, but on the brake. He uses the brake in order to drive, you know, in reverse backwards, right? And wherever the apparatus is for putting the car in reverse, I don't know if it's there or if it's down here somewhere, that is going to be in the reverse direction. We also recommend this only when backing up straight. If you need to make turns while you're backing up, we recommend using the hand-to-hand -hand model while you're backing up. A lot of us nowadays, although not all of us for sure, have some type of camera display some type of video display somewhere around here. Remember, you cannot rely 100% on the video display. Why? Because there are a multitude of potential hazards that will be coming in to the display when it's almost too late, okay? Um, especially little kids could be coming and coming someplace where your display won't even pick it up maybe halfway up the car. So, uh, and of course, you're not going to pass, pass your driving test if you only rely on the display as well, okay? So while you're looking backwards, you're also looking around. You're doing a 360 type looking at, look around, right? But the main thing is that you're looking backwards while you're doing this. Okay, I'm going to move on. Let's see what happens when I hit this button, if the if this can stays with us or if it disappears. It stays with us. It wasn't staying with us before. <coughs> it's going to take a while for me to 
clean it up too. Hmm. Wonder if there's an option that I'm not aware of. I wasn't doing this when I was doing a review of the lesson three quiz. Okay, a lot of cleaning up to do. I wonder if there's a way to make your eraser bigger. Hmm. All right. I'm still learning uh, a lot about Screencastify, and that's one of the things I will Google is how to make our pen larger and wider and also how to um, how to make our eraser larger. In the meantime, however, we're going to go back to our discussion. Excuse me, I've got some allergies going on and uh, it's just tis the season here. Steering discussion. What is the correct hand position for driving on a straightaway? What, where should our hands be? Okay. And when backing up your car. Okay. Okay. So if we're on a straightaway, where should our hands be if we need to adjust the control? And when, where should they be when we're backing up our vehicle? When we're on a straightaway, what I want to see you do is I want you to use your right hand to adjust any of the apparatuses that you need on the right hand side. Okay, your left hand is staying right at the nine o'clock position. If you need to adjust something on the left hand side, maybe your lights, for example. So with your left hand, you adjust the lights with your right hand, you hold the wheel steady at the three o'clock position. All right, that's different than when we're backing up. When we're backing up, our right hand is over our passenger chair, passenger seat. Our left hand is at the top of the steering wheel. And we're making very minimal movements to the wheel. And our foot, most importantly, is pivoted and on the brake, on the brake, applied, and releases it to get some momentum to go backwards, and then reapplies the brake so that we do not go out of control, okay? We slow our car back down. How do you know the wheels are straight? Well, guys, um, uh, if we are going, uh, if we are going forward, we can use our steering wheel. If the steering wheel is kept straight and we're looking ahead, we're not looking down at the at the controls. Our steering wheel should help us track that straight line, right? How do we know we're going straight if we're backing up? If our, if our hand is on top of the wheel, we're going to go straight. If it starts to slide to one side or the other, we know we're, st we're gonna feel the turn start to happen. When we are backing up, we should also recognize that it's the back of the car that's going to be swinging to the left or to the right as we start going backwards. Okay, let's continue. but I can't do it when I'm in eraser mode. Back to mouse mode. Okay, mirror review. Here's a reminder. Your mirrors are essential for all driving maneuvers. Absolutely all of them. When and how, sh how often should a driver use their mirrors? You, doesn't matter if you're going backwards or, or forwards, okay? But you are constantly monitoring your mirrors. Great. Good. I don't want you to be good drivers. I want you to be great drivers. Great drivers constantly are monitoring with their central vision what's happening behind them with their mirrors. They're monitoring cars. I'm going to use the word vehicles, cars interchangeably. They are monitoring vehicles behind them to, and they're monitoring their space cushion and their outs constantly. Okay. If you are in a traffic situation where almost all, let's say 95% of your attention needs to be devoted to what's happening in front of you, let's say you're in some really heavy traffic in Manhattan, for example, or on a bridge, it's another one, when you want to give almost all your attention to what's happening in front of you and to the sides of you, 
whenever you take your foot off the accelerator, that means your car is starting to decelerate. That's when you shoot a quick glance at your rear view mirror and you're looking with your central vision. Is that driver behind you and the vehicle behind you responding? That's called monitoring. Your, the car's called monitoring. Ma I like to use the word managing. You're managing that person behind you, okay? Because his responsibility is to mirror your speed. So if you start to decelerate, it's his responsibility to do the same thing. So monitor him. And then, you know, and we'll talk about managing him uh, later on in our course. But this is when we use our mirrors. So we use them constantly, all the time. You're constantly monitoring. Even in that really tight situation, whenever you start to decelerate or if you actually need to put on the brakes, you have to monitor what's happening behind you with your rear view mirrors. Okay, and it should be the other two as well, the side ones, to tell you what's happening. You know, our car's coming up through your outs, through your side space cushions. How do you know if your mirrors are adjusted properly? We're going to watch a video on this. For your side view mirrors, you should be able to see a small slice, a small portion of your the side of your vehicle. When you are sitting properly in your vehicle, uh, around 10 inches or so, maybe a little more from your steering wheel. Hands, your arms are um, not 100% extended, but they're quite extended so that you have maybe a hundred and, uh, let's call it a 160 degree angle with your arms to your, to your steering wheel. Uh, and you look at your two side view mirrors and you should see just a slice of your, of the side of your vehicle. All right. With your rear view mirror, you want to adjust it so you get that maximum view out of the back uh, window of your vehicle. You're going to have to adjust that for the maximum view. And number three, how do you adjust the mirrors for nighttime driving? Unfortunately, I don't have an offer for you as far as nighttime driving is concerned, but I do have an offer, or I mean, for the side side view mirrors, but for your rear view, there is almost always a tab there that you can flick. It's a standard part of the vehicle. Everyone has one. You can flick it one way or the other, and it will deflect the glare from the headlights of vehicles behind you. Okay, so now all of a sudden I have a whole nother bag of tricks here. And I don't know how or why this showed up here. It's kind of interesting. And I don't know what fireworks are. So let's go one more page and let's see what fireworks would be. Okay. And we talked about these. Oh, look at that. All right. Now I need to. Oh, all right. That was kind of cool. But I need to go back to my regular mode. Oh. And we missed a page here. And let's say, okay, here we go. Can I go back? I cannot go back. Can I go back now? I cannot go back. All right. Sorry, guys. And I no longer have my marker. <laughs> All right. So anyway, pulling toward the curb. We want to signal. We want to check mirrors, observe blind spots in area around the vehicle, and then, then depress the brake gently. Remember, signal, mirrors, check the blind spots for the head check. Okay. Use our brake gently. Why should we signal first with the and then brake? Because you want to communicate with the drivers behind you that you intend to what your intentions are okay when they see your indicator go on your blinker they will know that you intend to do something either to make a full turn or to or to park along the side of the curb note after parking your wheels must not be more than one foot from the curb. 
Okay, that's pretty important so that you, you know this for your driving test too, for your road tests. Remember, you must not open the door on the roadside if it will interfere with bicyclists or other travelers, other traffic. Okay, please remember that. Do not open your door up and then lose your door to a car. Um, don't get injured and don't injure a bicyclist. Remember, if you are cycling, remember that not everyone knows that that's, a, that's what they should do. So be wary of cars that have parked recently or pulled up recently to the curb. They might actually open the door in front of you. Same thing if you're driving. Be very wary of that. That's why we recommend that you get into a different position in the lane when there are parked cars. We want to see you get into what we call the B position. Uh, where your your left wheels are touching or very very close to the center line, okay. Or even if the and if the door opens, then so large there's no traffic coming the other way. You're going to actually make a maneuver and put your car into the A position, which is when your tires are your left tires are over the center line. So you're partially could be fifty percent could be more in the opposite lane so that you do not, I don't know, have an accident with the person opening up the door, for example, or someone coming out into the road, for example. Let's continue. Pulling away from the curb. Okay, so we're starting to get to what Mr. Wallace likes to call smog. Signal. Signal your intent to move into the traffic. You do that with your indicator. Okay, and we have a little picture up here too. I want to show you that. Oh, focus. Look at this. All right. So we want to signal our intent to move into traffic. That's going to tell someone like a bicyclist and other uh, users of the road that you intend to move your car into traffic. You're going to pulling it out into the left-hand lane if it's a two-lane road, right? Check through the rear mirror, rear view, rear window for pedestrians, bicyclists, motorcyclists and other vehicles and continue to use your rear view mirror to keep your eye on potential hazards behind the vehicle. Check your side mirrors for oncoming traffic and or road users like bicyclists. Bicyclist guys will come out of nowhere. They really do. So you really, and, and, and you know who else also comes out of nowhere? Our little kids. You really, really, if you're in a residential area, you need to be looking around constantly for little kids. They just don't know the rules of the road, and they just believe that nothing's going to happen to them. Everyone's looking out for them. Okay, so you really got to do that and make sure there's no little children coming around your car when you're about to do this. And when you are doing this, you're using the brakes as the way to control your car. You're not putting your foot on the accelerator at all. You're just using your brakes. You release the brakes to move the car, okay, when you're pulling out like this. Okay. Observe. So we went from signal, mirror, observe. Vehicle blind spots. That's with a head check, okay? And ensure that there is nothing blocking uh, your intended path of travel. Okay, so you do need to make your one last head check out into traffic after you've looked through your mirrors. Okay, there's nothing there. I'm going to pull out and then go. Okay, so again, that's taking your foot off the brakes when we're talking about go. Okay, so let's let's do this again. Okay, so here you are in your car. Go ahead and sit in your car like you would be about to turn into traffic. You're pulling away from the curb. There's no car ahead of you. Okay, let's pretend there's a couple of cars parked behind you on the curb, okay? So you really have to look around, okay? So here you are, your foot, your, you put the car into gear, your foot is tight on the brakes, the car's not going anywhere, okay? You're gonna check through your rear view mirror or your, your rear window for any type of potential hazard, a pedestrian, a bicyclist. You're looking around in any direction you can, 360. Looking around for anyone, nobody, Okay, now you're starting, then you move your, you start to move your wheel, okay? I, I move it before 
pulling out into traffic. I don't mind, you know, kind of like scraping it against the ground. It's okay. It's your wheels. Uh, it's your tires. They're not going to last forever anyway. Okay. Other than that, you don't do any damage to your car. You're just wearing the wheels a little bit. So I'm turning my wheel. Now I'm looking in my rear view mirror. Nothing there. Looking over to my left side view mirror. Nothing there. Okay. Then I'm doing my head check. That's my observe over my left hand shoulder into my blind spot. Nothing in the blind spot. Okay. Now I'm taking my foot off the brake. Taking my foot off the brake. My car is starting to move. It's starting to turn because I had already started turning. I'm looking forward. I'm looking that I'm going into the lane. I'm making my corrections with my with my steering wheel. So I'm going to center the car. And then I pivot my foot. I take it completely off the, the brakes. And then I start to apply the accelerator. That is exactly how we do it. That's exactly how we want your parent to comment on how to do this. Okay. Let me go back to my circle mode. And here we go. Okay, check for understanding activity one. Explain the proper way to hold and adjust your steering wheel to assist in control and safety. Okay, the proper way to hold the steering wheel, guys, is always nine and three. If you hold it 10 and two, like your parent may be telling you to do, it's absolutely fine. Okay, just recognize that if you do have an accident, the airbag may do some damage to your arms, may do a little bit more damage to your arms, put it that way. I'm not gonna tell you that your parents are wrong for putting it, putting your hands at 10 and two. I prefer it that way myself. Number two, how do you know if your wheels are straight? You can use your steering wheel to track, okay? You can use the pillars for your for your back, win uh, back window to track. If you see things moving into or out of the pillars, when you're looking backwards, that means you're not going straight. You can use so that your wheel should be above your, your dashboard and you can use the sides of it to track. Okay, here we go. When should you engage your turn signal? I am an early turn signal person. I think you should engage it as soon as you can. Okay. You should engage it, but in every case, in every single case, you want to engage your turn signal three seconds minimum, four seconds before you are going to slow your car down. Okay. Not before you're going to make the turn, before you're going to put your foot on the, on the, uh, on the brake. Okay or three, four seconds before you're going, you're going to take your foot determinedly off the accelerator. Okay, let's look at number four. What does the acronym SMOG stand for? You're gonna hear me use this from now on for the rest of the course, SMOG, right? Signal, mirror, observe, observe head check. That means observe, head check, look in your blind spot and then go, okay? When, when I mean go, it means take foot completely off the brakes and start applying the accelerator. Number five, what is one of the first steps to take when preparing to pull away from the curb? Well, first step, guys, to me is you put the car into gear, okay? You're not going anywhere if you don't have the foot in gear. So you got, in fact, before you can put the foot in gear or before you put your car in gear, you have to put your foot firmly on the brakes. Probably the first thing you need to do. Okay. Foot firmly on the brakes. You're going to change into your gear. You're going to do a 360 turn looking for potential hazards. After you've done that, nothing there. Look in your rear view mirror. Now we're going to, to the, to the, uh, you know, okay. Then you're going to signal, right? Then you're looking in your mirror. You're looking at the rear view mirror. You're looking at the side view mirror. Then you're going to do your head check with us. Oh, right. Observe. Take a look. Nothing in your blind spot. No dogs, no little kids. Okay. 
you're turning the steering wheel. You're releasing the brake. You're looking around still, looking ahead as you start to pick up speed. Nothing there. Very good. Start centering your car. Use some acceleration. Use this. Use the accelerator to get up to speed and straighten your car out. Very good. Oh, and here we got everything anyway. Here we go. Moving along. Turning. So key concepts for turning. And here we go. This is very important. So you want to signal 100 to 150 feet before the turn. I'm going to tell you, start signaling around two seconds before you're going to take your foot off the, off the accelerator. Okay. At some point you have to take your foot off the accelerator before you put on the brake, right? That's, that's two seconds before that is when you want to put on your, on your indicator. Okay, then that's going to com communicate to people who are paying attention that you intend to slow down your car and you intend to turn. I'm going to repeat that. Why is it important to, to, to so people, why is it important to communicate this? Because you're going to slow down your car. You can't just make a turn at 35 miles per hour. Okay, you're going to have to slow down your car to do that. People are need they the drivers around you need to know you're going to do that. Otherwise, they're going to run into you. That's why we have this indicator. Okay, and that's why we need to do it before we actually start slowing down the car. Okay, okay. Avoid signaling earlier than it is than this to avoid confusion about where you are planning to turn. Signal one, two, three seconds before you're going to take your foot off the accelerator. Okay. Slow before making the turn. Definitely. We need to bring our car down to speed. Gently. That means taking our foot off the accelerator. Starting to apply gently. Then start to apply the brakes. Okay. You got your indicator on. Everyone around you should recognize what your intentions are. Without that indicator, they have no idea what your intentions are. Right? You're just slowing down in the middle of the road. Slow before make. Yep. Okay. You don't want to use your accelerator again until you are through with your turn. It's better to go too slow than too fast. Absolutely. It's one of the things that my son always did as a beginning driver. He thought the speed limit is 35 miles per hour. Dad, I should be going 35 miles per hour around these turns. The speed limit is 35. That's what I got to do. He was totally incorrect, and it took him a really long time to recognize this. And so we would go careening through intersections at speeds that are, look, like three times as fast as, they, as he should be going. Okay? Sometimes he would actually take his foot off the accelerator in, during the middle of our turn, <laughs> but he never took his foot off the accelerator well before the turn. We're talking like two or three seconds before the turn. Okay. You just have to take your foot off, decelerate a bit, start decelerating more by gently applying the brakes, bring your car down to 10 to 15 miles per hour, especially on sharp turns. 90 degree turns are sharp guys. Okay. The sharper the turn, the slower the speed required to make the turn in a parking lot. If you haven't noticed, there's a lot of 90 degree type turns that you need to make. So you need to have a really, really slow car and you need to do a lot of turning with your hands and you should be getting used to going hand over hand in the parking lot. Okay. Another mistake my son would always try to do because he wanted to learn how to drive on a stick shift because he is from Europe and they don't even have automatic over there. So he was trying to do all this with one hand trying to make you know, 90 degree type turns with one hand. It was at some crazy speed of 35 miles per hour. Don't be like my son. He learned, but it, it, we, we, it, it took a long time to teach my son. He didn't get his driver's license right away. The sharper the turn, the slower the speed required to make the turn. We know that. 
Turning corners too wide is a common problem. It's happened with my son all the time. This is caused by turning too late or failing to reduce speed properly. That's exactly what was a problem for my son. He failed to reduce speed properly. Okay. If you feel like you're going too wide with your turns, if you're out of control, it's because you're going too fast. In a controlled turn, the rear wheels always follow a path inside the front wheels, okay? The longer your car, the more inside your wheels get. So if you're driving something really long, like a van, or even something longer than that, I don't know, or, or you're pulling some type of thing behind you, those wheels behind you are going to be on your inside of your front wheels, so they will go over a curb if it's too sharp, okay? So the sharper the turn, the greater the difference in tracking between your front and rear wheels are, and your rear wheels can jump up and go over onto the curb. You don't want that to happen either. How do you avoid that? First, keep yourself you know, controlled and slow, and you want to bring your car into the B position. If you're taking a right-hand turn, this is when it happens. You want to bring your car before you get, before you make the turn. You want to be in the B position as you're driving forward, and then as you're starting to clear the turn, then make your turn uh, and, and continue to steer in the center to B position. Here we go. Additional considerations when preparing to turn. Okay, Be alert to traffic on all sides of your vehicle when you're preparing to turn. Taking special care to check for motor vehicle, motorcycles and regular bicycles. Holy smokes. Most crashes involving a motorcycle and other vehicles result from the driver failing to see the motorcyclist. Same, of course, with bicyclists. Be always, especially in a town where there's a lot of intersections and there's a lot of traffic and a lot of people using the road, please, please be on the lookout for bicyclists coming into your blind side from the right-hand side. They're going to be on the right-hand side of your vehicle if you're making a right-hand turn. Always, always look for them, okay? If you're passing one of them, keep that bicyclist in your side view mirror until you are way past him. Keep monitoring him. Make sure he's far from you. And because if he's close to you when you start to make your right-hand turn, if they're not a very smart bicyclist, and often they aren't, they're going to keep going. <laughs> Even if you're making a turn on red and he should stop at red, they're going to keep going and you're going to run him over somehow. Okay. You're going to collide with him. Okay. So be very, very careful about bicyclists. They're, and they're extremely difficult to see. Right hand turns. Okay. Begin with here's how we do it. Okay. Think about approaching an intersection. Excuse me while I have a sip of coffee here. Think about approaching an intersection. Before you take your foot off the accelerator, remember, signal to the right. Take your foot off the accelerator, right? Remember, this is all happening around 100 to 150 feet, three or four seconds before the turn, okay? Slow down. That means start applying pressure to the brakes. Okay. Gently. Okay. We we're talking about a 90 degree turn, just like a regular intersection. We want to bring our car down to speed. Now we're not watching the speedometer. We're getting a feel for this as we practice our drives. We're bringing our car down to speed. Okay. It's better to go too slow than too fast. Okay. Scan the intersection as we're doing this. We're using our central vision and our fringe vision to get a good idea of what's what all is in there. Okay? So we're looking for other vehicles. What are they doing? We're looking at pedestrians. Are they are they standing still or are they going into the road? And again, we're looking for bicyclists. And especially if we're making a right-hand turn, we're looking for a bicyclist that's coming up from behind us in our blind spot. Also, we're looking across the intersection where we're going to turn right. We're looking at pedestrians and bicyclists coming towards us on the crosswalk, for sure, right? 
for our vehicles. We're looking especially at the vehicles that are coming from the left. Are they stopped? Are they going to stay stopped? Or are their wheels moving? If the wheels are moving, they're communicating to us that they are not stopped, right? They don't notice us. We're looking across the intersection at the oncoming traffic if they are intending to, to turn left. Sometimes, guys, not everyone uses their indicators. It's horrible. So he might be intending to take a left-hand turn, and we're watching his wheels. Are his wheels turning into our path of travel? Are they moving or are they stopped? These are all things that we are, that are going through your parents' head as they enter the intersection. Okay, And with practice, this is going to be what you're going to be monitoring too. Okay, And we want to make you great drivers. We want you to be monitoring all this. And it becomes second nature over time with experience. Okay, yep. And last thing, we want to monitor our space cushion behind us. We're slowing down. We took our foot off the accelerator. First time we take a look at anything behind us. Okay. Then we're about to put our foot on the brake, right? This is before we come to the intersection. Again, take a peek behind us in our rear view mirror. Is that vehicle mirroring what we're doing? Is he slowing down? If he's slowing down, we are managing him, okay? We are making him mirror our speed, which he should be doing, okay? He should be maintaining that space cushion. If he's not, we have a problem, okay? So we check, look up, rear view mirror. Okay, slowing down, we're good. He's following me, I'm managing him, excellent. Okay, we're putting on our brakes, looking at that space cushion. Is he slowing down? Okay, we're okay. Not slowing down? Okay, we got a problem. And we're going to talk more about that in later units. Right now, we want to just make sure he's doing what he's supposed to be doing. Okay, what are we doing with our car? I don't want you drifting too far right to in your lane. Why? Because if you do, then you're going to go over the curb. Okay. I like you to stay pretty much in the center. I don't want you drifting too far right. However, the farther right or the farther, the farther in the center of the lane we are, the more we need to make our turn. It is true. Okay. But it gives us more space in case there's a pedestrian or there's a bicyclist or something gets into our blind spot. And we don't want to drift too wide to the left. You know, it's true, but I like to stay pretty far to the left. It gives you more view and more space. Imitate the edge of the road when it curves. When it curves, you turn. Always look where you want the vehicle to go. You should be looking into that lane to your right. Make sure the front wheel clears before you steer all the way. Okay, yep, you, clears means this. You want that front wheel to be well beyond and not next to the curb uh, that where you were making your right-hand turn. Otherwise, if it's close to it, your rear view or your rear wheel will jump up on the curb. Okay, so it has to be well cleared of that curb. That's why I like to have you in the center when you're making these turns instead of trying to kind of cut them uh, off a bit. By, by getting too close to them on the right-hand side. Okay, recovery is after we do our hand-over-hand -hand steering and we're allowing the steering wheel to slide back through our hands, right? And as we're leaving, that's when we're taking our foot off, the, you know, because as we're going through our turn, when we're getting up to our turn, guys, our foot is still on the brake. We are managing our speed by using our brake. Okay, in this turn. Okay, and as we're making our turn, we're releasing the brake to maintain some momentum. Okay, and as we are clearing the turn and we're releasing the wheel so it will correct itself, we start to put our foot on the accelerator and we start to speed up. And that's how we make our right hand turn. Okay, right-hand turn example. Here it is. Okay, I'm, I, I, we just did it, so I'm, I'm, uh, I feel pretty good that we don't need to repeat that. 
I'm kind of a little bit concerned about our time here. We've been at this for a while now. Left hand turns. Begin, and I'm going to read this part to you. Okay, begin with your left signal 100 to 100 feet or 30, three to four seconds before the turn, right? So again, we're taking our foot up, we're, we're using our indicator, left hand turn, we're coming up to it, using our indicator, taking our foot off the accelerator, pivoting it, okay, hovering the brake. Then we start to slow down as we get closer to the turn, right? So we're gently depressing the brakes, okay? Bringing that car, you're going to have to feel it, bringing the car down to around 15 miles per hour for sharper turns, for regular 90-degree turns, okay? As we're doing all this, we're scanning the intersection, we're looking, getting the big picture, we're looking for a couple things, okay? Off to our right, we're making sure the traffic is stopped so that it won't collide with us. We're looking at the wheels, okay? Maybe looking at the driver. Is he looking straight ahead or is he looking down at his phone, all right? We're looking across the intersection. There's going to be oncoming traffic. Is that traffic gone? Are we cleared to make our turn, our left-hand turn? We don't have to right away. They do, right? So what are they doing? Are they do we have some cars coming up? Is it all clear? Do we have plenty of cars coming up? Because if we do, we're going to have to stop our car, come to a complete stop in the intersection until they have all cleared. Okay. I'm assuming we have a green light. All right. And a regular green light, not an arrow, but a regular green light. All right. We're looking across the intersection on the far side, the far corner to the left. We're making sure that there's no pedestrians that are coming in into the intersection, into our path of travel on the crosswalk, or maybe not even on the crosswalk, maybe a jaywalker, uh, 10 to 20 feet to the left of the crosswalk, right? You got to look out for, the, for these things. You got to look out for some bicyclist who is making a right-hand turn from the oncoming traffic lane because he may come into our lane, for example. These are all potential hazards that we need to be aware of. Maybe there's a car parked on the curb very, very close to the intersection. That's going to cause us some problems. It's going to make us get into the B or A position as we're making our turn. Okay. These are all typical things that are going to, you're going to experience in, in Staten Island, no doubt. Okay. We want to drift towards the left side. Okay. We, we want to be fairly close to B. Start by going straight and do not cut the turn, right? Especially because we got to make sure that the traffic is cleared coming across the intersection. Aim toward the center of the road. Look where you want the vehicle to go. This is absolutely true. Drive as if there is a vehicle on the corner. Recover, uh, recover. start straightening Start straightening your steering wheel approximately halfway through your turn. Okay, so turning might be hand over hand, and we're going to start releasing. Our foot the whole time had, has been on the brake. Now we have taken our foot off the brake as the wheel is recovering, and we're starting to depress the accelerator and centering ourselves in the lane that we had just turned into. Very good. Let's continue. Left-hand turn example, one way we just talked about it. So, okay, reversing left and right. All right, so a couple of things for reversing. Remember, we're, uh, we encourage you to use two hands when you're reversing and you're going, to, uh, you're going to turn one way or the other, okay? So before backing, check for traffic. Check for potential hazards, traffic pedestrians, little children, okay, uh, shopping carts, parked vehicles, any stationary objects, you know, like uh, signs or, or, or mailboxes are, are one, you know. You should be looking all around you, uh, and this is kind of how you want to, you know, comport yourself the entire time when you're 
going backwards is you really want to be looking around you at 360 degrees, like you're an owl, okay? Except your shoulders are moving too, right? We don't want you to try to twist your neck too far. Okay. Keep both hands on the wheel. If you're going to make a turning maneuver when you're backing up, you want both hands on the wheel. Okay, three and nine. Look in the direction you want to back the vehicle, okay? And turn the vehicle towards that position. So if you want to go right and you're backing up to the right, you want to turn the wheel to the right, okay? Now, it's important to remember It's, in, it's incredibly important to remember, and here I am right down here. I wish I had some little thing. Focus. Here we go. That your vehicle swings wide in the opposite direction. So if you are backing your vehicle in a tight place, it means, I don't know, uh, a tight parking space, for example. And when I say tight, I mean like it was hard to get into in the first place. You couldn't open your door up all the way. That's tight. Okay. If you can't open your doors up all the way to get into your vehicle, that's a tight parking space. You need to clear all that with a straight back up before you can start turning the wheel. Okay, that's incredibly important. I I did this to myself as a young driver. I still had my permit, I think. I was over at a friend's place. For some reason, I had to park in a tight spot. I was right up against this stone wall. I remember this. And I had to back up. I had, and I thought, okay, I need to make my maneuver and swing. You know, I needed to back up to the right because that's how his driveway kind of curved around. And so I backed up and backed up and backed up. And next thing I know, I'm rubbing my, the front left part of my car against that rock wall. And it did not look pretty at the end. And my mother's my mother's face, which was pretty, did not look pretty at that time either. Okay. So she still looks pretty to this day. But it didn't look pretty that day when she saw the car. It, she, she was not happy. Okay. My mother's not one of those who has a pretty face when she gets angry. You know? At least not to her son. Okay. So um, remember this too. You When you are backing up, you are using the brakes, okay? You are managing your speed with the brakes. Your foot is, is depressed on the brake, and it's releasing it a little bit to get some momentum, and then it's going back on the brake, okay, to stop, all right? And you need to be able to stop the vehicle immediately if something comes into your path of travel. And if it hasn't already happened to you, it will happen. Let's continue. Okay. I'm going to skip this. Act uh, let me read it real quick for you guys. Checking for understanding activity two. When do you signal for a turn? Remember what Mr. Wallace said? Around anywhere between one and three seconds before you're going to take your foot off the accelerator and start decelerating the car. I know we're going to have up here. Oh, we are talking about three or four seconds. Okay. Very good. Okay. What should your speed for a sharp 90 degree turn be? There we go. 15 miles per hour or less. Okay. You are really braking before the turn. That's right. So you're taking your foot off the accelerator. Okay. And then you're gently depressing the brake. Okay. Not, you're, you have to be prepared to come to a full stop. That's one of the reasons why we go so slowly. Okay, what happens if someone comes into the uh, into your path of travel? Okay, you, it, whether or not they have the right of way, you have to be ready. You have to be able to stop your car. What is recovery when uh, when associated with turning? Is regaining complete control after uh, over or under steering? I, I, recovery to me is you are releasing the wheel. The wheel is correcting itself, and you are now working on centering yourself in the new lane. Okay. What steps should you take in order to back to the left? Well, first of all, there, well, there was plenty of them, right? Turning around, general tips for turning around. Be smart, select the safest way to turn around. Usually the safest method 
is to drive around the block or pull into a parking lot. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, my grandfather was a pro at these two things. Okay. My grandfather would never, ever make a U-turn, period, ever. And you shouldn't either when you, as a beginning driver. Okay. Making U-turns is, is usually on a place where there's a lot. And, and I'm talking about on a commercial road or an inter intermediate road where there's a sign that allows you to make a U-turn. If you don't have green arrows to make that U-turn, please don't do it. Instead, do one of these things. Okay. You can make a full left-hand turn into a parking lot uh, or you can, into a different road. Okay, full left-hand turns, you will, you will be able to use a driveway or, or something else in order to turn yourself around and get back onto the road and go the, other, the opposite direction, okay? You can also do this on the right-hand side. You take a right and your next right, and then you can go down that road, that street, turn around in a driveway, make a two-point turn, for example, in a driveway, and, uh, or just turn the car around in a parking lot. And then come back up to the intersection and make a left-hand turn. Okay, that was a, those are better ideas than making a U-turn in a busy street. U-turns are particularly dangerous because um, your steering radius is dependent on two things: the manufacturer of the vehicle. Not all steering radiuses are the same. Okay, uh, Japanese, Asian cars in general have a, they don't have as good of a turning radius as American cars do. I can't comment on European cars that, that much, to be honest. Um, so they require less speed to make, uh, the other, the other uh, variable is speed, okay? The slower your car is going, the, the more it's able to turn itself if you have the wheel cranked all the way, okay? But Less speed means you're in that vulnerable position with oncoming traffic, perhaps, uh, when you're making your U-turn. Okay, backing into the driveway is a two-point turn. This is a pretty good one. You can back in or you can go front first. And then driving forward out of the driveway typically is safer than backing out. It is. I agree. Uh, if you're on a very um, uh, what's it, uh, not busy street. Okay, very quiet street. Chances are backing out is not going to be too much of an issue. If it's a fast road with traffic, definitely, definitely, definitely do not drive in face first. Back in. Okay. Smog. Signal, mirror, observe with a head check and go. And then roll slow, steer fast, right? That's slow car, fast hands as you execute, execute control and visibility when backing is necessary. Places where you don't want to attempt to turn around, okay? Yeah, for sure, okay? So now I'm thinking country road, okay? Near the crest of a hill or a blind curve or any location where visibility is an issue. So don't pull off, that should be off the road here, okay? Don't pull off the road where visibility is an issue because there's a hill or there's a blind curve. Look for straightaways when you're going to make, for example, a three-point turn, okay? Or you're going to pull off the road. You're going to back into a driveway. Do this on straightaways, please, okay? Do not change your direction on an entrance or exit ramp. Go ahead and fulfill the requirement of going up the exit ramp or, or down the entrance ramp and go to the next exit and, uh, and perform the correct maneuvers, okay? Do not turn around on a highway, period, okay? Or a fast-moving road. Don't try to pull a U-turn on a fast-moving road. You have to bring your car down to so, like to zero miles per hour, like almost a full stop to, pull, to perform a U-turn on a two-way road. It is so dangerous because of, the, you know, no, no speed and you're so vulnerable. Okay. What happens if you can't make that turn and you have oncoming cars coming at you, then what are you going to do? Drive your car into the ditch. Okay. Near a busy intersection, do not do it or in busy traffic. 
definitely do not try to make a U-turn or a two-point turn or a three-point turn in a school zone. Don't do it where a sign says or states that turning around is prohibited. U-turns are prohibited. Okay. U-turns in residential areas. Okay. So residential areas are a pretty good place to attempt U-turns, except one thing. You want to have one, the straightaway, two, a quiet road, and three, a wide enough road so you can perform your U-turn. So what's our first step? First step is always to, we're going to have to get to the, as far over to the right-hand part of the road as we can. Okay. So what do we do? We signal first. Okay. We're monitoring behind us already. Signaling first. Maybe their cars be, let's pretend, pretend there's, there's some traffic here. Because at some point, this is where we're going to be uh, in our lives, in our career with driving. Okay. So let's pretend we have some traffic on this residential road. But you need to turn around <laughs> for whatever reason and go the opposite direction. Okay, we're going to signal first to the right that we're going to pull all the way to the curb, all the way to the right-hand side of the road. Okay, take our foot off the accelerator. Our car is going to start decelerating. We take a quick shot. We take a quick look. We monitor with our rearview mirror what is happening behind us. Is the car behind us mirroring our Deceleration. Is it maintaining the space cushion? Yes. Great. Okay. We can start <coughs> gently depressing the brakes, right? Bringing our car down to speed. We want to get down to zero. So we depress gently, manage the person behind us by looking in the mirror, monitoring him, making sure that he is mirroring our speed and maintaining the space cushion. Look straight ahead. We're moving our wheels over with our steering wheel, right? Bringing our car over to the curb, pulling up to the curb, bringing the car to a complete full stop, right? You can watch in your rear view mirror and your left side view mirror to watch the traffic going past us, okay? We can take a quick look around 360, make sure there's no children or pedestrians or bicyclists or whatever else. Uh, around our car, okay? We're going to keep our car in gear, keep our foot to press on the brake, use our left hand and change our indicator so that it's going now to the left as if we're pulling out into traffic. We're looking for a clear space in the traffic from both directions, okay? So we might have to wait there for a while might take some time before the, the traffic clears well enough. And we want it to clear pretty well in both directions. We really do. Okay. So it's cleared up. No traffic behind us. We've looked. We're watching our mirrors. We're, we're, gonna, we're now going to make an, another quick glance around. No weird pedestrians or any type of potential hazard. And we're going to perform our smog, right? We're getting ready to go left. So we look in the mirror, nothing. Look inside view mirror, nothing to the left. We look over our left-hand shoulder, nothing in our blind spot. Looking out across at the opposite traffic, nothing there. We've turned our wheels. Our foot now is off the brakes. We're hovering on the brakes, but we are now releasing the brake. We're starting to move across the road. The slower we are going and the more cranked our hands are, the more of a turn our car is going to make. Okay. <laughs> we do have to be prepared <clears throat> that the car will not clear the entire turn. But let's hope it does. Okay. And let's presume in this case it does. And we get to the other side of the road and we're facing the opposite. Uh, we're literally facing... Uh, the opposite way than where we just were, okay? You can take your foot off the brakes, start centering the vehicle, and, and put your foot on the accelerator, and your, your indicator should come off automatically. And that's how we make our U-turn in a residential area. 
Okay, U-turns at intersections. Okay, we're talking now at intermediate or commercial roads. Usually, in fact, for us beginning drivers, for sure, we are looking for, uh, we're only going to perform this when we have a designated U-turn lane. In this case, we have two of them here. And look, we actually have lights. And this is pretty strange. One light is green and the other one's red. Okay, I mean, I don't know if I've ever seen that before. Or one's green and one's red. Okay. Um, they don't have to always look like these U turn lights. They could be just green somehow or green arrows. I think that's how I'm used to seeing them. Okay. But we really only want to make U turns when we have designated U turn lanes. Okay. And I'm going to read this one to you. Practice when there's no traffic. Absolutely. We don't want to start doing this when there's traffic. Only perform where it is permitted. And I want to say only perform it where you have, not only where you, you have designated lanes, but you have a designated light, like arrow. Okay, so what are we doing? We're driving along in our commercial road. Okay, driving along. Let's call it, let's say you're in the center of the center lane. And you know you need to, because maybe your GPS is telling you, but you know you need to make a U-turn. Okay, it's, the GPS is telling you at the next intersection, make a U-turn. Okay, so we're driving. We want to put on our left indicator, right? And U-turns are always going to be to the left. We're going to put on our left indicator. We're going to take our foot off the accelerator. We're taking a look in our rear view mirror. Is the car behind us? Is the vehicle behind us mirroring our, our deceleration? Has he noticed? Okay. Yes. Okay. Very good. We also need to look at our side view mirror. We have to know that there that the because we're going to want to get into the left hand lane and we're making a lane change here. So we're looking over. Uh, we we want to make sure that that's clear for us to do. If it's not, we're going to have to keep on going straight and we're going to go past that intersection. Okay. So we look. We use our mirrors to the left too. Nothing in the side view mirror. We're going to have to make. Quick look, this is all part of smog, we're signaling, we're using our mirrors, we're looking, we're observing over our left-hand shoulder, nothing in our blind spot. Okay, gently we make our lane change and we get into the left-hand lane, which is going to be our U-turn lane. Okay, now as we approach, we have to depress the brakes and bring ourselves down to speed. Remember, a U-turn, we need to be really down to close to zero miles per hour. We're talking like five miles per hour, depending on the type of car you got and how sharp that U-turn is going to be, okay? Remember, cities aren't going to give you a U-turn option if they don't have a, a nice wide enough way for you to make your U-turn, okay? So that intersection is going to be pretty darn wide, okay? All right, enter the correct lane. Okay, so depending on which one we're going into, the one nearest the meridian or the outside one. Okay, we have two of them here to choose from. And often there's only one, okay, and that's going to be the one nearest the meridian on your left. Okay, your meridian or whatever it is, is going to, there's going to be that yellow uh, line, right? That's, we, know, we know that's the line that, that ends the, 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 our path of travel, right, that road. Okay, so... Uh, yield if there's no green arrow, right? So we're going to have to allow any and all oncoming traffic to clear before we perform our U-turn. And because we need to be as close as we can to the meridian, we, are, we will have to make our stop way before we... It, it, we can't make it in the middle of the intersection for a U-turn. We have to make it before we, uh, before our front nose of our car is past the meridian, okay? Or at least our front wheels. We got to just keep it stopped until all the traffic clears, okay? And it might take some time. It might take a long time, especially if we don't have a green light for this, all right? Come to a complete stop, or if rolling with a green light, reduce speed way below 15 miles per hour. Absolutely. You need to use hand-over-hand -hand steering or turning in this, in this case, okay? 
until the car is turning at the same angle as the lane. Release with acceleration. Okay, so we're going to release. When we release, we're releasing our steering wheel, so it's correcting itself. We are, and acceleration in this case is taking our foot off of the brake. Okay, as your car starts to recover, then we can we can apply gently the accelerator. Okay. Remember to stay in the U-turn lane as marked on the pavement. There should be pavement markings if there's a designated U-turn lane. It's going to be the nearest opposite lane. Okay, here we go. Two-point turns. Okay, using a, a driveway. Okay, allows you to change directions using a driveway or a cross street. Point refers to a place the vehicle stops for both two-point and three-point turns. I think I'm going to stop the video here and I'm going to make a part part two to go over two point turns because I know we're going to also be talking about three point turns and parallel parking. And this is a good place to take a stop and pause for a bit.